right, and welcome everyone to the 2018 edition of the Ingram Angle from Washington. I'm telling you, liberals are now using sexual harassment, undoubtedly, beyond the shadow of a doubt, for political ends. And the predictions about the president that were all wrong, that's the focus of tonight's angle. All right, before we get to our main topic, it's a new year. And signs of progress made by the president and his administration are everywhere. They're like blooming. It's like springtime. A little cold for that, but remember a year ago about when the liberal prophets of doom were predicting that a Trump presidency would tank the stock market, kill jobs, and mark America's retreat from the world? Boy, were they wrong. And a year later, even the New York Times is grudgingly admitting that due to Trump's regulatory rollback, business leaders are now awash in a wave of optimism, manifesting in, quote, investment in new plants, equipment, and factory upgrades that bolster economic growth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, forecasters are now readjusting their projections for the year upward. Good. It's, it doesn't always seem like it's downward, but this is now upward with Trump. And today's Wall Street Journal above the fold reported that wages are rising double the national average in areas with some low unemployment. After years of stagnant wages, cities like Denver, Minneapolis, Fort Myers, and Austin are seeing paychecks start to swell. That's really good news. Here's my prediction. As Trump policies and the tax cuts settle into the country, our economic news is only going to get brighter in 2018. It's only two days in, and it truly already feels like a happy new year. But now to the latest sexual harassment opportunism coming out of Hollywood. To great fanfare, they got star treatment in all the magazines, newspapers. A group of 300 female power players in Hollywood announced what they're calling the Time's Up initiative. It's an effort to fight sexual harassment and other gender issues across the country and in the entertainment industry itself. Now, it's awfully convenient that these powerful women, many of whom knew for years about the ex exploits of Harvey Weinstein and others like him, are now seeking to cleanse themselves from any guilt by association with this type of grand rollout and gesture. But beneath the girl power platitudes and the recruiting of oh, Anita Hill to write up a blueprint to end Hollywood sexual harassment, it's something, all of this feels just like another leftist political hack group. Like it's almost like a political action committee. And at the heart of the Time's Up group is a legal defense fund, you're seeing some of the photos, with a $13 million war chest that's going to be used to litigate harassment claims. And donors to fund this? Meryl Streep, Reese Witherspoon, Steven Spielberg, and other Hillary backers, and by the way, several talent agencies, well, under duress, no doubt. It's kind of like what Jesse Jackson used to do with his Operation Push. Well, the defense fund is being led by Tina Chen. As far as I could tell, her only previous claim to fame was that she was chief of staff to, wait for it, Michelle Obama. The whole effort is being overseen by the National Women's Law Center's Legal Network for Gender Equality. That's a mouthful. But this legal ne network was just created last October, according to the CEO, Fatima Graves. She told the Huffington Post that the group was founded in response to the Trump presidency's, quote, all-out assault on women's rights. Oh, so I'm, I'm sure conservative harassment victims will feel very welcome and protected there. Let's be clear what this is all about. This is not just some beneficent effort to protect women, although the trappings of it are there. This is an obvious and craven attempt by Hollywood leftists to collect email addresses and other information and organize for 2018 and 2020. Time's Up members include Ava Longoria, Natalie Portman, Rashida Jones, Kerry Washington, and others who have issued, I think, a hilarious challenge. Now, this is the big sacrifice they're asking of women. At the Golden Globes on Sunday, I know you're all going to be watching intently, women are being asked to wear black and use the red carpet to argue for racial and gender equality. Black. Well, black is kind of classic, but it's also can be kind of depressing. 
But then again, you think about it, given the fact that their entire box office was dependent on the 40-year-old franchise of Star Wars and a 76-year-old Wonder Woman, well, perhaps the color of mourning is indeed appropriate. Women are paraded down the red carpet. They're expected to look beautiful, to smile, usually not to say much, et cetera, et cetera. So what Ava Longoria said to my colleague Cara Buckley in the paper, uh, in the story that was published yesterday, she said, we're not willing to just be ornaments this year. We're mm. not willing to go out and sell this award show without asking any of the big questions about power in Hollywood. Don't you just want to tune in? Well, maybe this is a kind of a blatant attempt to drive up Golden Gold Globe sagging ratings. It keep, keep going down year after year, but I'm not sure it's even going to work. By the way, many of these women are the same women who have made millions of dollars flaunting their bodies for anyone who cares to watch. And at times, you've been watching these award shows. There's some talented people there, some beautiful uh, folks, women and men. But at times, the dresses seem to be defying the laws of physics, right? Um, it's a double-sided tape. How do they keep that up? For a while, it was almost as if Hollywood was creating a new category. And accepting on behalf of, for the deepest neckline is, well, I mean, you can wear whatever you want. But then don't be shocked when people, including men, stare. It's going to happen. Now, these same people, producers, writers, directors, agents, and actors, who have objectified women, and in some cases themselves, they're suddenly the moral conscience of the entire country, not just the entertainment industry. They're going to safeguard women across the country. Well, what are we going to believe? That they're looking like, what, pilgrims this award season? What are they going to be wearing? Oh, okay. Oh, that, that's actually a good look on her. Perhaps a little house in the Prairie Collection will be making its premiere at the Golden Globes. What are you wearing? Uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder? Well, look, don't hold your breath. You know who's going to do more help to help women than anyone else this year, by the way? They won't admit it. But I'll tell you who. Yeah, there he is, Donald Trump. An improving economy is good for all Americans, including women, women entrepreneurs. Remember, women are half the workforce, if not more, in certain parts of the country. They need a growing economy, wages going up, optimism, confidence. So the Hollywood crowd, they're great at stomping their feet and fundraising for liberal causes. But if they really cared about their industry, well, they'd stop hypersexualizing women and young people. And until they do, their audience will continue to flee and seek safe harbor elsewhere. In other words, Hollywood, time's up. And that's the angle. Joining me now for reaction in New York is Monica Crowley, who is a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research and also in New York is Julie Alvin. She's the digital director of lifestyle titles at Time, Inc. All right, Julie, I said a lot in that angle. So tell me what I got wrong. Correct me, tutor me, Julie, go ahead. Frankly, I think it's almost bizarre that you believe that this is some sort of liberal conspiracy constructed to, you know, collect email addresses to campaign for 2018. These women are standing up, not just for people in their industry, but they're standing up specifically in this letter for women who are unable to speak up for themselves, women who are in low paying jobs, who are farm workers, who are working at hospitals, who are working in hospitality, who are working in hotels, at restaurants, women who do not have the funds, uh, don't have the platform to talk about sexual harassment, but who do experience large amounts of sexual harassment. They're connecting these women with legal uh, experts. They're connecting them with with money. They're they're laboring um, and lobbying uh, organizations for legislation that uh, you know helps people speak out against this. That penalizes places that use non disclosure agreements to silence women who've been victims of sexual abuse. So I'm 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 honestly confused on why you seem You're to think confused? this is this, this nefarious project. I think that it's something so the that National is good Women's for women. Law Center. That very long title. That's kind of you know, at the core of this effort. It was just started in October, and one of the core mission statements of this group is focused on Donald Trump. You don't think that lends some political taint to the otherwise, you know, laudable goal of protecting women in the workforce? This from an industry that has made millions and millions of dollars hypersexualizing women, taking advantage of young women who are naive and frankly ignorant 
of the way men could be and are oftentimes in the workplace. Now suddenly they get millions of dollars for an organization that's populated by all liberal actresses, as far as I can tell. And we're supposed to believe, oh, they've just found their moral conscience on this. I mean, it doesn't even pass a straight face test. Not I mean, bizarre. It's totally, it's totally uh, logical that that's what this group would be about when they focused on Trump right in the beginning. I think that this is, you know, the things that you point out about this industry, hypersexualizing women and treating women poorly and putting images of women out there that's sort of unsavory, I think that's exactly what part of this initiative is trying to address. So, you know, 80-some percent of, of board members in Hollywood are men, 96 percent of directors are men, 71 percent of writers in Hollywood are men. And when these stories that do objectify women are largely being told by men, I think part of what this uh, initiative is doing, especially with the part of the initiative that's it's trying to find gender parity. These stories it, aren't just being told by men. Women write their own stories. Women write their own stories about how, what roles no, they take, what they're going to do. Of the directors are men, so I would say that's All right, not let's true. Let's go to Monica. I got to get to Monica. Monica, yeah, look, when when they have a group called 5050 uh, for gender parity by 2020. 2020 is a presidential election year. I don't think it takes a you know a, a you know genius. To figure out that there might be more than just a philanthropic goal here uh, behind this uh, effort. Your thoughts? Yeah, Laura, this looks like the latest mobilization of Saul Alinsky's phrase, never let a good crisis go to waste. The sexual harassment crisis is real. Women do suffer at the hands of, of superiors and men across every industry, as we have seen. But what we have just seen here in the last couple of weeks, and certainly with these latest two groups, is an effort by the left to take this genuine crisis and hijack it into two directions. One, in this liberal left-wing uh, direction, and more specifically, to have women that now supplant men in, in positions of power and authority. If women genuinely deserve those positions, more power to them. But if they don't, if this is just going to amount to yet another quota system, then we have a problem. The other direction that this is being mobilized in, Laura, is the direction of Donald Trump. In many ways, the accusers of Donald Trump in, in late October of last year, right before the election, that in a way was ahead of its time, right? Before the Harvey Weinstein story broke all of this wide open. What they want to do is make those accusers relevant again. They are going to try to reanimate this whole thing in order to target Donald about Trump. Trump. This is of about course. Trump. Uh, Monica, course. Monica and Joe. I think you political. guys are the only ones trying to politicize okay, got, this. Guys, we got to get into another issue. Um, and I want to explore something else with you and, and uh, show you how this type of thing can manifest itself. The big dollars being raised, big bucks being dedicated to derailing the Trump presidency is what I'm saying about with this charges of sexual misconduct. This happened shortly before the election. On New Year's Eve, the New York Times reported that Hillary Clinton backers David Brock and Susie Tompkins Bell gave $700,000 to Lisa Bloom's law firm. Now, that money was to support any woman who would come forward with allegations against candidate Trump, but not one woman took the offer. What does that tell you, Julie? Is there any political taint with that money coming from Hillary's good friend, David Brock? I understand where you're coming from in this. I certainly don't like the idea of exploiting or specifically going after digging up that sort of uh, dirt uh, in order to, you know, for, for political means. Um, that said, it's not like this money was supposed to go directly towards those people who potentially may be ac making accusations. This was money to go towards relocation expenses, towards legal fees, towards concrete things like that. And, you know, again, I don't like the idea of sort of uh, trying to dig and uh, potentially exploit people who have legitimately been sexually harassed or abused. But there is evidence that, um, you know, there have been lots of allegations against Donald Trump for sexual harassment. He's spoken openly himself about touching women in a sexual manner without their consent. And so there's concern there. There's smoke. And I think that, you know, there are women out there who have been mistreated by Donald Trump. And I think that our country deserves to know about that. So David Brock is a longtime pal of Hillary's, runs all these, you know, uh, you know groups that support Hillary Clinton and others. He was at one time a conservative. He wrote a book exposing uh, Anita Hill. And now it's pretty ironic, is it not, Monica, that Anita Hill is, is brought in by Hollywood to, you know, to oversee this effort to, I guess, expunge all sexual bias from Hollywood, or at least try to. I agree with you, Monica, what you said. There are men in positions of power, abuse their positions, and take advantage of young women especially who need an opportunity. 
there is also a political element running right through this, as most of the people recently accused, most, not all, have been people on the left. And that's just a fact. And all these Hollywood people who have been, who have been accused, I don't think there's one, is there one conservative? I don't know, maybe there's one or two people, but most of these people happen to be Democrats. That's another reason I think this movement has been broadened out leading up to 2020. You can close it out. Well, in this story on Brock and, and this money that went into Lisa Bloom's firm, Lisa Bloom, the so-called champion of women and women's rights, right? We are seeing a weaponization of sexual harassment, which I think is a genuine tragedy, Laura, because there are real cases. And the, the real women who have been victimized by this kind of bad behavior are now going to have their credibility fall into greater question whether or not Lisa Bloom or some of these other political activists are by their side. And that's the real tragedy here. All right, ladies. And by the way, CNN ended the year on this ridiculous high note. Hannity alluded it to earlier. A reporter marveling about the ways to get legally high in a pot den. You guys see that? And I'm taking heat. By the way, I'm taking heat from the media after calling them all out. This one is one you're going to want to stick around to. Stay there. CNN rang in the new year with something rarely, if ever, seen on national news. A reporter holding a joint and lighting a bong. The network's New Year's Eve coverage included several live shots from reporter Randy Kay in Denver, who reminded viewers that marijuana use is legal in Colorado. Listen, uh, I came prepared, you know, this year. I thought maybe I would bring a gas mask with me so I wouldn't, you know, get that contact high. But look at what's on the other end of the gas mask. Yes, a bong. You yeah, packed, packed it. Packed okay. Okay, so you're going to, now what? Now you're going to celebrate a little New I mean, Year's I'm early or what? I'm with you. I've never hit one. Oh, of right. Years, so okay. This, I don't think this is really what a gas mask is used for, but, um, wow. You're That's just right. giggling now, Randy. Oh, my God. Randy's dose is kicking this in. This is for Andy. <laughs> Andy, this is for you. Oh. No, this is a this is oh the puff pass and party. Oh. Do you want this? Oh my god. I can't <laughs> this is what a, <laughs> Total dopes. I'm sorry. S dopes smoking dope. A group called Mothers of Children Affected by Marijuana calls CNN's coverage a free infomercial for big weed. Joining me now from Columbus, Ohio, is a member of that group, Corinne Gasper. Corrine, uh, like I was happily on the dance floor on New Year's Eve and dancing the night away with friends and, and others. And I didn't watch a minute of television. I'm glad I didn't. But you, as a mother who lost a child to someone impaired uh, while taking medical marijuana, I can't imagine your reaction to seeing that. It was very outrageous to see... Um what I would call would be irresponsible journalism on, on behalf of CNN. Well, they, they're saying, look, this is all fun and games, Corrine. Uh, you know, it's legal. You know, it's illegal in Colorado. It's a federal crime, by the way, still, but it's legal in Colorado. <laughs> and it's now legal in California. They did big ribbon-cutting ceremonies and lovely little moments all over television that night. Uh, tell us about your own uh, family's tragedy, as difficult as it is, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, my daughter, Jennifer, had just graduated from college. She was just 22 years old, on the verge of a wonderful career. She wanted to actually go out in the world and fight drugs. She began her first job, um, not in her field of study, but she was called into work as a district manager into one of the stores when an alarm went off. As Jennifer made her way in, she was T-boned at an intersection by a man who was traveling 82 miles an hour through a red light. My daughter's car, car was pushed across the road through a bunch of shrubbery, shrubbery and then through the, the doors of a lube stop building and the building collapsed on top of her car. Mm. My daughter lost her life that night. The man that did this was uninjured, but he was high on medical marijuana. Oh. He was given a very light oh. sentence of just two years in jail. He only spent 17 months there. And now yeah, he's out and he's off parole. It's, it's infuriating. And all we hear about is how marijuana is the only thing you can take to ease pain and that anyone criticizing it is heartless. And by the way, Corrine, uh, Newsweek attacked me, and I don't really care, but I mean, I wear it as a badge of honor, but basically for having a similar reaction 
to the CNN coverage as you did. I tweeted out, well, we'll see how all this works out for our country. More potheads, increase in cases of schizophrenia, psychosis, more impaired driving as big weed makes billions. So Newsweek ran a piece with the headline, Pot Panic. Fox News' is Laura Ingram roasted after criticizing <laughs> CNN New Year's Eve coverage. Well, I was hardly roasted. They pulled a few tweets out. Ooh, I'm scared. And uh, this is what they do to you, though, if you dare to take on big weed, big pot, and the multi-billionaires and millionaires that are funding this effort for legalization nationwide. Um, your, your comment to mothers uh, who are seeing this legalization movement grow nationwide, uh, how, to, how to get involved, given your own loss. I can't imagine. I have a, a daughter who's 12 years old. I can't, I, 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 it's, we don't need any more, anyone else dying on the road. But indeed, we well, will have I, this, unfortunately. I do think that we need to contact our senators and our governors and our state officials and tell them that uh, we need more education in this area. A lot of people are filled with misnomers that have been put out by the, uh, the medical, I mean, you know, the, the marijuana industry. And I definitely think that we need more education because this isn't the weed from back in the 70s. This is a very powerful drug and it causes psychosis and many other things in people that smoke it. Uh, and the more we legalize it, uh, the more younger people are trying it at earlier and earlier ages. Uh, there's already, so evi there's really already evidence of that. No, evidence is building and growing. And I, I appreciate you having the courage to come on tonight. And even though even hateful things are said about you and the victims of this legalization effort, and uh, I just really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's go on to debate this issue. So is the question, is the ever-expanding legalization of recreational use of marijuana inevitable? Or is it a, just a blight on the nation that we should fight to actually reverse? Here in Washington with me is Will Jones of the group Smart Approaches to Marijuana, which opposes legalization, and Professor Chris Goldstein, who's in Philly. Uh, he is a legal marijuana advocate who teaches a class called Marijuana in the News at Temple University. I never got to take classes like that. That's a bummer, Professor. Uh, let's let's uh, start with you, Professor. So. You're, you're good on this legalization effort. Um, we've already seen the evidence uh, building, the American Academy of Pediatricians uh, uh, documenting what the use in young people uh, of the effects of pot in young people. They're starting to try it at earlier and earlier ages. Young people tend to have an, uh, a, a, a likelihood to get addicted in the way adults don't get addicted perhaps to pot the developing brain. Are you concerned about any of that? I'm certainly concerned that almost 100 years of prohibition has set us far back as far as education and science goes. You know, these stories about marijuana on the highways and even the questions that we do have about how marijuana affects the human body, we haven't been able to answer those because of prohibition. Now that marijuana is actually being legalized across the country and in states like California, which have a great academic infrastructure, we expect to maybe answer some of these questions. But the reason we don't have uh, a roadside THC test is because of prohibition. We've, we've been kept from doing any of the science involved. My concerns are more about educating the public in the right way and making sure that people understand that legal marijuana is not dangerous. It's not dangerous to the, to the individual, not nearly as dangerous as the policy of prohibition has been for almost 100 years. Will? I mean, first of all, I don't like using the word prohibition because that's not a great analogy for what we have with marijuana. If you think about it, prohibition, the, the thing that comes to people, people's mind is what we had with alcohol. And what we have with marijuana and alcohol is not any way analogous. We had stores, we had a whole industry that was around, uh, and then we tried to shut it down. That was prohibition. Right now, except in now a few states that have tried to legalize, we don't have this huge industry that is uh, ingrained in society. And our argument is that we don't want to see an industry that's going to profit off of addiction establish, it, establish itself in our society. Just looking at the data that's coming out of Colorado, we're already seeing how the marijuana industry is replicating, the alcohol industry is replicating the tobacco industry, and they are profiting off of addiction, and we're seeing negative uh, societal 
consequences from that. One thing that's hugely concerning to well, me is... Well, the marijuana is, industry that exists today is the underground marijuana market, Will, and that's oh, the problem. Really? We oh, have really, no professor? regulations over the underground marijuana market. Oh, hey, wait, in, hold on, I gotta get in and here. And it's there in every town. Now, professor, this might work on your students, okay? But you're in my classroom now. Let me tell, let me tell, let me tell you how it really works. We actually have Hollywood looking to brand marijuana in California. In other words, celebrity endorsements. Oh my obviously, goodness. you're going to have Willie pearls. Nelson. Obviously. Uh, student, you oh, haven't no. been called on I, yet. I, I'm glad. So we got Willie now, so we got Wiz Khalifa, that, we got Snoop Dogg, we got sure. all of it. So what do you think that says to the kids, Professor? I know kids in your class, if they show up high, you'll probably give them an, an, an A+. Plus. But if you were trying my to, let's say... My class is more boring than you'd imagine. Uh, A lot of my class it. is doing data research on the 20,000 oh, really? marijuana arrests that happened in Pennsylvania Okay, we're not talking about year. decriminalization. And that's the problem, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about decriminalization. I don't even care about the idea of just decriminalization doesn't get to the heart of the matter. And Will, I want you to address this because this is what the Academy of Pediatricians have really dug into. And they're not even saying they're against legalization. They're just talking about the effects on the young developing brain. Schizophrenia, psychosis, depression, anxiety, 9% of all people experimenting with marijuana get addicted. That percentage goes up to 17% with people who began using marijuana at a young age. It goes up to 50% when people began daily use at a young age. That's the difference. It's not, you know, having a beer uh, every now and then. This is a, a powerful type of drug that is addicting in a percentage of Americans that is not insignificant. Definitely, and what the industry is I going to do is it's going to, well, is, hey, is Chris, Chris, just let me get a word in yeah, here. Well, the industry I, is know, going to allow. we're talking about prohibition. Let's talk about addiction. Oh, yeah, that's addiction a, is the, the industry is going to, to normalize and glamorize just we're like we saw on dependence. CNN. It's going to glamorize the use of a substance uh, that does have some negative um, negative health impacts. And what I'm particularly concerned about as an African American and why I started uh, in, you know, talking about this issue in the first place is let's look at alcohol and tobacco. They disproportionately target communities of color. Some studies out of, out of Hopkins show that minority communities have eight times as many liquor stores as other, as other communities. There's a negative health impact from that. When we look at what's happening in Denver, Colorado, there's one pot shop for every 43 residents in some of the minority communities in Denver, Colorado right now. If I we want to talk about American if we want to talk about arrests, don't want it, the impact of the police in their community. All right, so let, let's talk about arrests. Then I, I'm glad you brought up arrests. So, so you know what we've got. I'm glad you brought up arrests. But look advertising in African American communities. We're talking about the police that in Philadelphia, what the reason we decriminalized marijuana here. Yeah, we got to go, guys. City we're, we're up against a heartbreak. Step. We'll have you both back, though, because this sure. is a, this is an issue that's going to percolate Lord, all through politics. Come on I, radio tomorrow with we me. We just want to um, make sure that there's some we, marijuana on Fox We want to make sure that we have Laura. real data. It's not Absolutely. Just CNN but let, let, let me just say, everybody's, that you're glamorizing. Guys, we're out of time. By the way, another Clinton email saga. You guys will want to watch this. Stick around. Taking another bizarre turn. We're going to unpack all of it and the investigation, the details, who they've interviewed, who they haven't interviewed yet, and are those immunity deals really as good as the paper they're written on? All upcoming. <music> President Trump is demanding his own Justice Department investigate Huma Abedin, former top aide to Hillary Clinton. On Friday, the State Department released a batch of emails that the FBI discovered on the laptop of Abedin's estranged husband, Anthony Weiner. And those emails were from Abedin's account when Clinton was Secretary of State, and at least four of them were marked as classified. This morning, the president fired off a tweet that seemed to call on the, quote, deep state DOJ to investigate Abedin, Comey, and others. Trump contrasted their fate with that of a sailor who got jail time. Petty Officer First Class Christian Saucier was sentenced to a year in prison in August of 2016 for mishandling classified information after taking cell phone pictures inside a U.S. Navy submarine. The sailor's attorneys even argued for leniency by comparing him to Hillary Clinton. Let's discuss all this with Saul Weisenberg, former deputy independent counsel in the Whitewater investigation, who's in Raleigh, North Carolina. And here in the studio with me is Scott Bolden, former chair of the Democratic Party in the District of Columbia. Happy New Year, everyone. Great to see Good you evening. both. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Let's Happy talk, New Year to um, you. Uh, now Scott, it starts. Yeah, let's no, start. <laughs> Laura's getting ready to go all right. after us. All right. Here we go. No, Scott, so tell me uh, <laughs> your thoughts on this, what we know now, and just the the parody or lack thereof on the way 
the handling or mishandling of classified information is treated. We're now learning more about the emails yeah. that were sent to her Yahoo account. They were confidential in some cases. It looks like classified information that was sent even after we learned about the Yahoo hacks. Right. They, we have hundreds of thousands of accounts compromised. She still kept sending it over. To me, that if not negligence, that's it's, it's recklessness at the very sure. least. And it is reckless. But but here's the deal. All of these cases are different. They stand on their own. And the mere fact that they were reckless and sent it over a public email, whether it was her uh, 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 Hillary Clinton's server or whether it was Uma's server, doesn't create criminal intent. And until you can create criminal intent, I don't think and you need you that can, intent, right? Oh, in the I statute? think you do. Yeah, yeah, you do. Every criminal case. Well, I'm so sorry, every criminal charge. Not on the handling of classified or, information. Or specific I don't information. think. On that, Saul, mm -hmm. you're the legal eagle. Pardon. You got it all in your mind. Don't don't you have a lesser standard of intent? If my memory serves me correct, Saul, uh, uh, for well, this particular on one, on statute, one of the, one of the statutes. Uh, on one of the statutes, uh, as we now know, uh, gross negligence is all that is required. But really, the key to to me, it is very difficult to compare military cases to uh, the case of Secretary Clinton and Miss Abedin. But the key is really how the—I wouldn't look so much at the outcome, the different outcomes, but how was the email investigation of Mrs. Clinton and her entourage conducted? And we know, we absolutely know now that it was really an abysmal and disgraceful investigation conducted not in the normal way, and that's very, very troubling to me. Well, listen, here, here, here's the deal. Uh, whether you, it's gross negligence or general intent, uh, these investigations are very different. If you compare Hillary Clinton's investigation to the other investigations, there are lots of... Pro I'm a former prosecutor. There are people in the office who would agree with any criminal prosecution, and that's why you have more than one person looking at the case, and then more than no, ultimately me, one person with, has me, to make that me, decision. Let me share, share with you what John Solomon reported tonight on The Hill. Uh, the piece is congressional investigators find irregularities in FBI's handling of uh, Clinton email case. The evidence includes passages in FBI documents, gentlemen, mm -hmm. stating that the sheer volume of classified information that flowed through Clinton's insecure emails was proof of criminality, as well as an admission of false statements by one of the key witnesses in the case, according to investigators. It goes on and on. But that's but this an investigator's is, opinion. Well, this and there are a lot of opinions as part of an investigation. There's one decision maker, whether it was Comey or whoever heads, headed up the investigation. Or, or Peter he, Strzok. He listen, no, 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 not at all. Don't go there. That's but, a ghost but, of Christmas but, past, but Peter he, Strzok. here's the deal. They can have their opinion, and they're supposed to have any investigation who have differences of opinion. It doesn't mean that the case has to be reinvestigated, reprosecuted, or relooked at, because DOJ is not a political animal. It's an independent agency that stands for justice. No one owns it other than the people of the United States. How would you reinvestigate this? And by the way, all those cases that you bring up that are, quote, comparable, they're not comparable. Those individuals had no business with the information. They did other crimes like computer of crimes. Taking a photo inside a submarine goes Absolutely. to jail for a year. Yeah, and you know where they found it? You know where they found it? You know where they found You know where they found He you found his, his phone, and you know where they found the pictures? In a, tr in a dump. Uh, in his back, not in his backyard, right, so, but in some jurisdiction. But do and you it, think we were he, lucky to even get that back? He didn't have any intent. And then he lied about it, and he covered yeah, it up. Well, he didn't have. He clearly, clearly didn't do any of that. You may right, not like so, the investigation. So the fact that they destroyed all these emails, the fact that that, that they were were only speaking to she investigators if they got them, immunity. Though. If somebody uh, Saul, destroyed them, so be it. Saul, does the sheer volume here of this uh, of these emails that cross the transom from a to into a Yahoo account? Does that tell you anything more about intent here? Then I want to get into some of what's happening with the president's tweets, but very quickly on that point. It, it's a piece that goes into the decision on intent, but you know, Scott said something interesting that the DOJ is not a political organization. The DOJ at the highest levels and the FBI at the highest levels under the Obama administration was highly political. And the Clinton email investigation was a farce. Anybody, and Scott knows this, he's not talking about this. He's a former prosecutor like I, like I was. I'll be more anybody than happy to talk about it. Anybody who knows anything about how the Department of Justice does investigations can point to seven, eight, nine things in the Clinton email investigation, numerous things that keep coming out that were not by the book that are deeply troubling. You do not give 
immunity to people when you don't need to, when you it's can subpoena their, their documents. It's their discretion. You do not give you immunity. Not give you may not immunity. like the result. Okay, but, we're almost out of time. Attack it. But what? You, you yeah, don't well, got, you not give, compare, well, you can't politically. Well, compare, well, that, well, compare that to Michael Flynn. Wait, compare what they did to what happened to Michael Flynn, and I don't defend Michael Flynn, but he told a rather, in, he told a barely material lie and he yeah, gets a go. felony and they have and they have a computer person who they knew had obstructed justice and then gave him immunity so that he could tell them how he obstructed justice. All right, and you have to keep to something be, discretion. To be, Talk about discretion. Yeah, to be continued, John. They've got it. And by the way, they were handing out immunity deals. <laughs> like, this is like popcorn it's just flying around the room. The they were. Yeah, well, They're doing it's the pathetic. And, and by the, it's and pathetic, by the, and Scott, and the you way, know it's pathetic. <laughs> happy, I may not agree with it, but happy that's the New power Year. of discretion. Happy New Year. Is this a happy New Year so far in the Ingram angle? <laughs> and by the way, gentlemen, I have a question. Can protesters actually topple that repressive regime in Iran? You think it's a uh, Impressive here sometimes. No. <laughs> and Trump's message tonight to North Korea's rocket man, Bolton, next. <laughs> President Trump is strongly supporting the freedom seeking protesters who are flooding the streets of Iran for the sixth straight day after Obama essentially gave him a cold shoulder back in 2009. But there's a danger here. While the president is right to back those confronting Iran's repressive theocracy, just as President Reagan, of course, encouraged freedom seekers behind the Iron Curtain, the U.S. certainly can ill afford to get involved on the ground in another Middle East catastrophe in the making. So let's turn to Fox News contributor and former U.N. Ambassador John Bolton here in the studio with me, and David Tafuri in West Palm Beach. He served in the State Department under President Obama. Happy New Year to both of you. All right, Mr. Ambassador, let's start with you. Uh, where are we tonight on Iran? Well, I think these demonstrations are very significant. I think this is uh, dramatically different from the 2009 demonstrations because I think what's at stake here is the future of the regime itself. So I think the president is exactly right to say the United States is uh, watching what happens. Uh, I don't think there's any question of military involvement here or anything else, but I do think it's in U.S. interest to support. When I hear regime change, I heard you talk about that over the last couple of days. Doesn't we should support a regime, mean, but I have to calm down about that because it can be just like yeah. our alliance with Lekwalesa and Poland and The fact so is forth. there's a huge amount of opposition to this regime. It has nothing to yeah. do with the United States. Economic discontent, ethnic discontent, the young people, 70 percent of the country know they could have a different kind of life. And I think this regime is much more vulnerable than people think. Think. It's dangerous. There's no yep. question about it. I think Trump's on the right track. All right, uh, David, let's turn turn over now to what's happening uh, in North Korea because uh, the president put out a tweet. Uh, I think we put it up on the screen, uh, which I can't read from here. Oh, there it is. North Korean leader Kim Jong Un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Well, someone from his depleted and food starved regime, please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, capitalized by the way. Uh, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. <laughs> David, uh, your reaction to that? Well, that's kind of a funny tweet, and it's good to see that President Trump has a sense of humor, but this is also a serious topic. He's right to remind North Korea and its leader that he also has a button that we will use military strikes against North Korea if we cannot come up with a diplomatic solution. But the emphasis still has to be on a diplomatic solution. But going back to your conversation about Iran, there's an important point in Iran. And But let's note the difference between Iran and North Korea. Iran is an unstable authoritarian government, but without nuclear weapons, whereas North Korea is an unstable authoritarian government with nuclear weapons. And that's a very significant difference. And the reason we have that difference is because yeah. we have a nuclear deal with Iran that caused Iran on to give up its nuclear weapons. Yeah, well, Obama, Obama hung them out to dry, though, David. I mean, he hung those people out to dry. They were not able to get any support from the United States. He basically deferred on that question. Like, well, they're going to have to determine it for themselves, which, to some extent, I, I get that, but not when it's the largest state sponsor of terrorism. But I want to stand this North Korea deal for a moment. I think there's something else going on with these with these tweets back and forth. I don't think it's just a firing off a tweet about North Korea. Do you, Mr. Ambassador? Well, I think the president's made it very clear that the only solution to North Korea is denuclearization. And, Period. And by that, he means no nuclear weapons. And uh, since I think there's zero chance North Korea is ever voluntarily going to give up nuclear weapons, it requires either dramatic action by China or China's cheating. It. China's and, cheating. And I think that's as been we knew clear they were for a long time. Yeah. 
So uh, if the binary choice is you leave North Korea with nuclear weapons or you take a look at the use of military force, I just think that option's got to be on the table. Now, what the president needs to do is not tweet about it. He needs to move forces into the region because the only way to get China and North Korea to take this potential use of military force seriously is to make it real. And right now, it's not real. David, if Japan ramps this up and J Japan decides to go nuclear, uh, that's not a good situation for China. China doesn't want that. The region doesn't want that. But I think that's what President Trump is probably saying to Xi in his conversations. That's correct. And so China has a lot of reasons to try and be more helpful. They haven't been helpful enough yet. And what we need to do is continue to work with our closest allies in the region, like Japan and like South Korea. We have to work together and we have to set goals for getting North Korea to come to the table. And President Trump should probably not tweet as much. He should set an objective for North Korea and then she, yeah. he should let his people well, handle it and get North Korea to the table. Well, I think uh, he's been left with a big mess and he's going to have to clean it up. Gentlemen, Thank you so much. And coming up, before the president meets with congressional leaders, I'm going to reveal my list of the must-do items. Have to be on the list before any DACA deal. What the president must get in return for his country and for the voters who, who uh, voted for him in, uh, of course, the last election. Stay with us. I understand that President Trump is going to meet with congressional leaders tomorrow to try to hammer out a DACA deal. Democrats and establishment Republicans desperately want some kind of legal status for the nearly 800,000 illegal immigrants unrolled under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the so-called DREAMers. Well, that gives the president a lot of leverage to get what he wants, what we need in his immigration agenda in return. So if Trump is going to give the Dreamers any kind of legal status, I have a sensible checklist of what he must demand in return. And this is all comporting with what he campaigned on. Number one, build the wall. Get the funding. And I'm not talking about a puny down payment. I was hearing something about $1.6 billion from, I think, Speaker Ryan's office at one point. We need meaningful funding for the border wall. And that's a permanent structure, not some chicken wire on the border. <laughs> Building the wall remains a top priority for the voters, and it is a promise that must be fulfilled. I know the president is committed to, to that. Ending chain migration. This is one of the biggest travesties of all time. America used to have a common sense policy of giving priority to immigrants based on merit, on what they could contribute to our society, what we needed. Now, basically, all you need is a second cousin twice removed in the country, and you'll get a free pass. No problem. We have to return to a practical system. Also, we have to end the joke of the diversity lottery system. About 50,000 people get in on diversity alone. And at a time when our national security is threatened, we've already seen these examples of it, what's the point of admitting immigrants at random? This diversity lottery system should never have been enacted. And it must end, no questions asked. There's bipartisan support for that. Okay, here's one the business community is not going to like. Make E-Verify mandatory nationwide. Big business loves cheap labor, but we can't allow them to undercut American workers any longer. Forget about that. Can't do it. And finally, we have to cut the number of legal immigrants by reducing the number of green card holders by half, 50%. That's basically the Rays Act, my friends. Trump was not elected to help the Dreamers. He was elected to build a wall, enforce the rule of law, and protect the American people. Your move, Mr. President. We're going to be right back. We have a great windup. Do not move. Closing thoughts on that pot debate we had earlier. CNN.com, the same people were celebrating with the bong and the, and the weed. More pregnant women are using pot. pot according to CNN study. What could possibly go wrong with that? And listen to this little statistic. Under 18, the use of pot has climbed from 12.5% to 21.8% in 20, uh, yeah, people under the age of uh, 18, 18 to 24, it's also going way up. So CNN celebrating with pot on New Year's Eve, and they're the ones who put this story out. I mean, come on, guys. This is, this is, nothing, go, nothing can be wrong for the baby or the mother with increased pot use for pregnant women. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Shannon Bream is back to take things from here. I'm delighted to see her. Miss Shannon, Happy New Year.